Hey guys, welcome to this video on 24 high yield facts, disorders of the stomach. As always guys, I appreciate all the support from you guys, I really do. And um, if you like the video, please drop a like. If you want more videos, feel free to subscribe. Um, if you have some suggestions, any feedback, uh, feel free to drop a comment in the comment section. For those of you that follow me regularly, you can see I've kind of changed some of my equipment and layout. If you don't like it, if you think it's distracting, let me know, I can always tweak things again. Um, in any case, here we go. One, the most common cause of upper GI bleeds uh, is peptic ulcer disease due to duodenal ulcers. So overall, let's just talk about uh, GI bleeds really quickly. If we're talking about upper GI bleeds, we're talking about bleeds that happen proximal to the ligament of treats. The ligament of treats is this ligament right here that's attaching to the duodenum. So we have our proximal duodenum, distal duodenum, right between the middle, you have the superior mesenteric artery. Recall from the anatomy lectures that the superior mesenteric artery can compress the duodenum here uh, between the aorta, and um, that can lead to superior mesenteric artery syndrome. But in any case, um, what we're talking about here is where GI bleeds are occurring. Proximal, right, will be before the ligament of treats. Distal will be, um, or lower GI bleeds, I should say, are distal to the ligament of treats. So the most common cause of upper GI bleeds is peptic ulcer disease. We'll talk a lot about ulcer disease in this video. Duodenal ulcers are um, classically uh, associated with this, but in general, you can have upper GI bleeds from gastritis, you can have esophageal varices, um, Mallory Weiss tears, Borhoff syndrome. So a lot of stuff that we talked about in the esophageal pathology videos can also do this. Um, as far as peptic ulcer disease goes, um, it can be associated with H. pylori, NSAIDs, and a lot of other um, stress-related mucosal diseases that we'll talk about here in this video. Uh, aspirin, clopidogrel and, clopidogrel, and warfarin increase the risk of bleeding synergistically. So if you have somebody on one of these, they're at increased risk. If they're on multiple, they're at exponentially increased risk of GI bleeding. Typically, things you would see if someone had overt bleeding, um, hypotension, tachycardia, you know, check their orthostats, um, that kind of thing. In general, always look for chronic liver disease if someone has uh, the potential for having an upper GI bleed, right? In those cases, we're looking for varices, right? Esophageal varices, which we discussed at great length in the esophageal uh, pathology videos. Um, signs of chronic liver disease, right? Palmar erythema, spider angiom angiomata, um, ascites, gynecomastia, jaundice, all that fun stuff. Um, really quickly, just to get some terms out of the way that we might use. So hematemesis is when you're bleeding bright red blood, right, or fresh blood or fresh clots. That's typically associated with a proximal GI bleed. Coffee ground emesis is dark kind of specks of older blood that's been sitting around for a little bit. In other words, the blood has had time to oxidize. Coffee ground emesis is commonly seen if, like I said, the blood's either been around a while. So it might be a chronic bleed or it might be blood that's coming potentially from a bleed that's distal to the ligament of treats. It's possible. Okay, so it, you can get coffee ground emesis in lower or upper GI bleeds. You can actually get hematemesis in either one too, right? It just depends on how fast the bleed is happening and where the bleed is at. More commonly though, hematemesis is associated with upper GI bleeds and coffee ground emesis is more associated with lower GI bleeds, but not hard and fast rule. Conversely, in the distal GI tract, you have hematochesia, right? That's bright red blood per rectum or fresh blood. Usually a lower GI bleed or a fast bleed and melena is that dark tarry appear appearing stools. Okay, two. All right, let's get this picture out of the way here. Upper endoscopy must be performed when suspecting upper GI bleed. So, you know, upper endoscopy is, is very rarely a wrong answer. Let me tell you when it's a wrong answer. It's usually a wrong answer if you're um, thinking about esophageal perforation. In those cases, you don't want to be messing around with an upper endoscopy because that's when you can make the perforation worse, right? One of the most common causes of Borhoff syndrome, um, or just, I guess I should say, esophageal perforation in general is iatrogenic injury, right? So you don't want to be messing around with upper endoscopy, um, you know, when you're when you're suspecting perforation. Now, on the other side of that, if there's a bleed, malignancy, right, anything like that, it's not a bad idea to um, to do an endoscopy, right? Because you can biopsy, you can actually treat bleeds by clipping, cauterizing, right? So important test to evaluate. Now, I'm not crossing out the hemoglobin and hematocrit here because I don't think they're important. I do think they're important, but the hematocrit and the hemoglobin, I want you to know that they lag behind what's actually happening, especially if you have a, a brisk bleed. So just remember that MCV, if it's low, it's likely suggesting uh, iron deficiency anemia. That could indicate a chronic bleed. It can also indicate malabsorption. So keep that in mind. B1 is classically elevated with bleeds. PT, PTT, and INR are really important if you have a bleed, especially if this person's on warfarin, right? 
you want to check the coax and the LFTs. Why would you check the LFTs, right? LFTs are going to be important in a, in a question stem or in real life because you want you want to rule out, right, the possibility that this is portal hypertension and gastric varices. So you'll classically see patients with cirrhosis that have elevated L, uh, LFTs. So if you have somebody that comes in, they have an upper GI bleed. In any board question, the first step, you do your ABCs, right? You start off with the airway. If they have severe hematemesis, right, they're bleeding into their airway, they're choking, you do uh, you do an intubation, right? Um, hemodynamic stability. So two large bore IVs, preferably 18 gauge uh, or better. And uh, you can do transfus transfusions and um, administer fluids as needed. Um, the thing to remember, we talked about this a little bit in the last video. So if you you know start giving too much fluids or you uh, you know transfuse too much, that can actually accentuate the rate at which the bleed's occurring. So you have to you have to be careful with with um, with that. And then nasogastric tube. So nasogastric tube. There's an image here. So if you're not familiar with the nasogastric tube, is it goes through the the nares here and it goes all the way down through the oropharynx down to the esophagus into the stomach. So the idea here is is that we can decompress the stomach using this tube by getting the contents out, especially if there's a bleed. And when we get the contents out, we can see, you know, is there uh, bleeding occurring, you know, potentially a bleed either from an ulcer or from the esophagus that's going down into the stomach. And as we pump it out, we can see if there's blood there or not. What else do we have here? So if it's if you did endoscopy and you said, hey, look, this is a non variceal upper GI bleed. In other words, there's no varices here. Typically, these patients will get at least PPIs to start with. Okay, now if it's a variceal bleed, though, you do not want to give PPI. So if it's a variceal bleed, this is more high yield to know, um, you can give octreotide. So what's octreotide? So octreotide is a um, somatostatin analog, and we use it when uh, we're suspecting variceal bleeding. So what does it do? Octreotide inhibits glucagon release. Now, glucagon is a vasodilator. So if you inhibit glucagon, you're inhibiting vasodilation of the splanchnic tissue specifically. So I should have said that. So glucagon is a vasodilator of splanchnic tissue. So if you inhibit glucagon, you're going to get vasoconstriction of splanchnic tissue. This is important because if you constrict that the splanchnics, you're going to decrease inflow of blood into the portal system and you're going to reduce portal pressure. Okay. And like I said, endoscopy can be diagnostic and therapeutic. And for your viewing pleasure, here's a picture of a uh, upper GI bleed in what appears to be the esophagus. Three, H. pylori is the most common cause of peptic ulcer disease. So peptic ulcer disease is due to an imbalance between protective and destructive mucosal factors, okay? Um, so there's two major causes that you should know, but there's a few that we'll talk about. Um, the first one is H. pylori. That's the most common cause overall. So overall, 90, I think it's 90% of duodenal ulcers are from H. pylori, and then 70% of gastric ulcers are also from H. pylori. So it's the most common cause overall. NSAIDs would be right behind that, okay? So NSAIDs can also cause ulcers, and we'll talk about exactly why that is in, in a, a few uh, slides. I don't want to get too involved in that in this slide, but um, so in terms of H. pylori, what is it? Because this is something that we're going to talk a lot about. So H. pylori is a gram-negative bacilli commonly described as uh, spiral-shaped, or the, sometimes you'll see like a gull-wing appearance or comma-shaped um, bacteria, and you can see it here in this image. There's some of these comma-shaped like structures. Um, the classic virulence factor for H. pylori is urease. So what does urease do? Urease takes urea and breaks it down, okay, like the name implies, and it breaks it down to ammonia and CO2. Now the ammonia, the bacteria uses to neutralize the acidic environment of the stomach, the CO2 we exhale, which is going to become important when we talk about the urease test. Um, CAGA and VACA, these are two toxins that are associated with uh, stomach mucosal inflammation. They can also deal host tissue damage, um, and they're associated with um, some metastatic processes that I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then, of course, it has a little flagella so it can move around and uh, navigate its way through the gastric epithelium. And then here you see a picture of what appears to be an ulcer. This is something that, you know, on endoscopy we would biopsy, right? And this is probably an, an image from endoscopy. Okay, four. Duodenal ulcers are relieved with food intake. It's particularly important to know that duodenal ulcers improve with food intake, whereas gastric ulcers will worsen with food intake. Now, in real life, is this true? Um, you know, I, I don't, anecdotally, I don't think it is, but it's in the literature, and it seems to be. Um, it seems to be. A, it seems to have been studied. Okay, so, um, but on questions, it's particularly high yield to know this. Now, the duodenal bulb is the most common site of duodenal ulcers, and the lesser curvature of the stomach is the most common site for gastric. This is important because remember, the lesser curvature of the stomach uh, has the left and right gastric arteries kind of running over it, and we'll talk about why that's important in just a few minutes. Um, and also, the last really important thing to know about this is that gastric ulcers have a higher risk of malignancy. Now, one last thing, duodenal ulcers improve with food intake, right? So you're going to see patients that have weight gain with duodenal ulcers and weight loss with gastric ulcers. Okay, five. 
NSAIDs inhibit function of COX-1, decreasing prostaglandin production. So NSAIDs, like we said, inhibit COX-1. That brings your prostaglandins, PGE2, right? It brings that all down. Now, this image is particularly important because we, we talked a lot about this image when we went through um, physiology. And I'm going I'm to keep going back to this image in, in these slides. Hopefully, it'll help you out a little bit. Um, so if we decrease prostaglandins, what happens? Well, normally prostaglandins activate the GI inhibitory cascade, which causes an inhibition of CAMP in the parietal cells. And CAMP is what's upregulated from histamine and the H2 receptor. So prostaglandins and somatostatin both do this. Now, if I get rid of my prostaglandins, I have less inhibitory pressure on CAMP, so more acid is getting secreted into the lumen. So that's kind of the general concept. Now, some other effects outside of the lumen, you also have an inhibition of mucosal blood flow, and you have less mucus that's being secreted overall, so there's less protection of uh, the gastric of the gastric mucosa. <laughs> I can't talk. Of the gastric mucosa. Um, in a question stem, just think about a patient that's on like chronic pain medications for a long time. They're frequently taking NSAIDs for pain. And, um, you know, these are the kind of patients that are going to be predisposed to gastritis, ulcers, um, and that kind of thing. So that, that should be kind of like your clue or your hint uh, that that's going on. Okay, six. EGD is performed in the setting of alarm symptoms for suspected peptic ulcer disease. So again, EGD is synonymous with upper endoscopy. So if you have alarm symptoms, just like with esophageal pathologies, we said you're going to do upper endoscopy. So what are some alarm symptoms? Unintentional weight loss, progressive dysphagia, iron deficiency, deficiency anemia is a classic one for chronic blood loss, or like we said, malabsorption, um, recurring or refractory emesis, uh, and again, family history of upper GI malignancy. So some non-alarm symptoms would just be like epigastric abdominal pain. If that abdominal pain um, was refractory to treatments and it's not going away and it's persistent, then that becomes more of an alarm system. Um, just general nausea and abdominal fullness, bloating, those are things that usually are not alarm symptoms. So you kind of have to use your clinical judgment, especially in a question stem on this kind of thing. Um, but the whole idea is, again, when we do endoscopy, we can make sure that there's not a chronic bleed, we can rule out malignancy, and we can see definitively what's going on. And if, you know, on biopsy, we can definitively diagnose a lot of uh, different pathologies we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. Okay, seven. Urease, urease, I can't talk. Urease breath test is the best initial di initial test for diagnosing H. pylori. Okay, so this is really important. So urease breath test, right? We said urease cleaves urea into CO2 and ammonia, right? CO2 gets exhaled, ammonia protects the bacteria. Um, if we do a urease breath test, you have to know they got to be off PPIs for two weeks and they can't be on any anti- <laughs> They can't be on any antibiotics, okay? Um, so that includes Pepto-Bismol, which is bismuth, okay? They can't be on that either. Bismuth actually has bactericidal properties, which we'll talk about when we talk about quadruple therapy. Okay, so urea gets cleaved into these two substances, right? The urease breath test, how does that work? So we measure someone's CO2 that they normally exhale. Then we give them a tracer, okay, with an isotope on the urea. And what that does is when if that urea reaches the H. pylori, it's going to cleave it into a now radio-labeled ammonia and CO2. The radio-labeled CO2 gets exhaled. So if we pick up more radio-labeled CO2 versus the CO2 that we originally detected, we can diagnose it. And that's essentially how that urease breath test works. Now, that's the best initial test. The gold standard test, though, is going to be surprise, surprise, upper endoscopy again. And um, we want to biopsy the peripheral region of the ulcer typically. And if we see the gram negative bacilli, right, you see those that gullwing appearance or that comma shaped spiral bacteria, that's diagnostic. You can also do serologic testing. You can do IgG for H. pylori. Just remember, if you do IgG for anything, if you've previously been, been infected, it's automatically going to be positive. It's not going to tell you a whole lot. So that's why that's not a best initial test. Um, you can do stool antigen tests. You can do um, test uh, cultures as well. Eight. Triple therapy is first-line treatment for H. pylori infection. So particularly high yield to know this, triple therapy includes pentoprazole, which is PPI, clarithromycin, which is a macrolide, metronidazole, or amoxicillin. You take your pick. Uh, PPIs are superior to H2 blockers. That has to do with direct versus indirect inhibition. So direct, remember, in our physiology videos. If you haven't, if you don't know what I'm talking about on some of these uh, images, go back and watch the physiology videos. I think they'll really help you a lot, kind of nail this stuff down. But um, so PPIs are superior to H2 blockers. So why is that? So remember, H2 blockers are going to inhibit here. So cementidine is an H2 blocker. It's blocking histamine binding to the uh, H2 receptor. So that will prevent this cascade from happening, this GS cascade, and so you'll have less hydrogen pumped into the lumen. Now, if you block here, you're not only blocking the histamine H2 receptor, you're blocking the effects of gastrin, you're blocking the direct effects of the vagus nerve on the M3 receptor, you're blocking everything. So that's why PPIs are superior to H2 blockers. Just know that PPIs typically can increase the risk of bone fractures in general, and so calcium supplements are commonly given for long-term use on PPIs. Um, 
so that's first line treatment. If the patient is refractory to first line treatment and it's, it's not working, you know, you've diagnosed H. pylori, you did triple therapy for a week to two weeks, it's not working. Now you can do quadruple therapy. Quadruple therapy involves your PPI and metronidazole again, but this time you're going to use tetracycline as your antibiotic. Bismuth, which is uh, peptobismol, like I said, it can have some anti inflammatory and bactericidal action. This is for H. pylori. Remember, if someone has an NSAID-induced ulcer, you're not going to be doing all this stuff, right? Because they don't have H. pylori. This is just treating H. pylori. If they have an NSAID-induced ulcer, you're going to stop the NSAID. You can put them on a PPI, and you can give them a prostaglandin analog like misoprostol, for example. Okay, nine. H. pylori increases the risk of malt lymphoma. So um, <clears throat> this is one of those unique situations. This is really high yield. This is one of those unique situations where you can treat cancer with antibiotics and a PPI, which is really, really cool, actually. So um, duodenal ulcers typically do not lead to malignancy. Remember, this is only really gastric ulcers. And, and for molt lymphoma, this molt stands for mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue. It's a cancer that originates in the B cells in the marginal zone of the mucosa-associated um, lymphoid tissue. Okay, so classically, this is due to chronic inflammation from H. pylori, typically having to do with this um, CAGA virulence factor. So uh, how do we treat it? Early stages, we can do triple or quad therapy. You can literally treat this thing with antibiotics, right? Your triple therapy or your quad therapy. Now, if it's in the later stages or if it's refractory, you want to use rituximab. Why would you use rituximab? Rituximab is a CD20 inhibitor. It affects B cells, right? CD20 B cells. B cells are the thing that's wrong here. Okay, let's take a look at some pictures. First, we have a lumen. It looks like a gastric lumen, and we have all these bacteria. If we look close enough, which it's really hard to do here, um, we would see that gull wing appearance, that comma-shaped bacteria. That's your H. pylori in the gastric lumen. And then here we can see this lymphoepithelial like lesion. So you see all of these lymphocytes in here, and you see this infiltration and destruction of these of gastric glands. And so if you see lymphocytes flooding the gastric mucosa, you might want to be thinking malt lymphoma. You might see a bunch of lymphocytes if you had chronic gastritis, which we'll talk about in a minute, but you wouldn't see quite that many. It would be significantly less. Okay, 10. Refractory peptic ulcer disease can be a sign of zollinger ellison syndrome. So zollinger ellison syndrome has to do with gastronomas. So what's a gastronoma? So a gastronoma is a tumor that releases gastrin, just like the name implies. So typically those are in the duodenum. That's most common, but you can also see them in the pancreas. If you have someone that is releasing a ton of gastrin, that gastrin, um, just in general, gastrin uh, causes uh, trophic action. So it causes hypertrophy of the enterochromaffin-like cells and the parietal cells. Um, Normally, gastrin is, in, is controlled, kind of put in check by negative feedback mechanisms. Specifically, somatostatin uh, releases this GI cascade to inhibit the effects of gastrin here, and it also can affect um, other pathways related to gastrin. So that's how gastrin is normally affected. Somatostatin can kind of shut it down, or secretin can kind of shut it down and control things. But when you have a gastrinoma, you just constantly release gastrin from this tumor. Um, so zollinger ellison syndrome is neuroendocrine tumors. They're gastrinomas. They cause severe peptic ulcer disease due to unopposed gastrin release. And, um, you know, the downstream, of, downstream effects you end up getting is you have this really low intestinal pH because you have all this gastrin being released. And that low pH inactivates uh, pancreatic digestive enzymes. So now you can't break down your fats, your bile acids, all that stuff. And so you get maldigestion, malabsorption. Particularly how you'll to know if you see anyone or if you see... You're probably not going to see anyone with this because it's really rare. But if you have a question with Zollinger Ellison syndrome, um, the three things that you consider when you're when you're making a connection to MEN1 are your parathyroid tumors, your pituitary tumors, and your <clears throat> GI tumors. So, really quickly for um, MEN1, right? MEN1, there's you need two of the three, two of the, these three P's to diagnose MEN1. Parathyroid tumors typically you have increased PTH, hypercalcemia, bones, stones, grown psychiatric overtones. You know, um, so. That's one side of it. So flank pain, right? Kidney stones, those are things you're looking for. Pituitary tumors, right? Prolactin, growth hormone, those are the two big ones. Um, optic chiasm can get impinged. That can cause a um, bitemporal hemianopsia. Uh, pancreatic eyelid cell tumors, right? Insulinomas, VIPomas, um, glucagonomas, all that good stuff. So those are things to consider, okay? All right, 11. Somatostatin receptor scintigraphy. Octreto scan is superior imaging study to detect gastronomas. And when I say superior, I mean it's better than CT MRI. So the best initial test, first, let's start there. The best initial test, if you suspect Zollinger Ellison syndrome, you want to you want to uh, do a fasting serum gastrin level. This only works if they're off PPIs for at least a week and H2 blockers for at least 48 hours. So they got to be off everything. It's similar to like H. pylori testing. Okay, then you can do a fasting serum gastrin level, which by the way is a pain in the butt to get someone who has ridiculously high gastrin off of PPIs because they're going to be in so much pain um, for a week. So in real life, that's hard to do, but in any case. All right. So if you are if you want to diagnose this right off the bat and you do a fasting serum gastrin, they need to have uh, gastrin 10 times the upper limit of normal. That number is a thousand. 
Now, if the gastrin is not 1,000 or higher, if it's between 100 and 1,000, so between normal and 10 times the upper limit of normal, you would do a secretin stimulation test to really investigate if this is actually Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. What you're trying to do is you're trying to distinguish Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, which is a tumor that releases gastrin no matter what. It doesn't care who's around. It doesn't care what hormones are around. It just releases it versus antral G-cell hyperplasia. Antral G-cell hyperplasia is a situation where you just have G-cells that are releasing more gastrin than they should. Okay, so you're trying to um, figure out which one it is. If you do a secretin stimulation test, secretin will inhibit the antral G-cells from releasing more gastrin, so the gastrin should come down. Whereas with Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, it will just keep releasing gastrin and the gastrin will remain high, so it won't necessarily inhibit it. So that's kind of how you distinguish the two of those. Um, so really quickly, Octrio scan. Here, you can see that uh, we've used some, so on an Actrio scan, we use indium um, labeled markers, and those markers are essentially, uh, ha it's an indium labeled octreotide marker, and the, the remember, octreotide is a somatostatin analog, right? So what does somatostatin have to do with anything? On the actual gastronoma, there's type 2 somatostatin, re somatostatin receptors, and so this analog that's indium labeled that we can see, the radionuclide marker, binds to the gastrinoma, and so it lights up when you do the, um, the Actrio scan. And so we can see it here, there's an arrow pointing to the gastrinoma. But you might be wondering, well, what's all that other stuff? So you have your kidneys, right? Your kidneys are lighting up, your bladder's lighting up, spleen's lighting up. So those are that's because, you know, this marker is, is eventually going to go into the kidneys and the bladder, and we're going to essentially um, pee it out, right? So, um, but the gastrinoma, those receptors are, are going to also... Um, or I should say the, uh, the somatostatin analog, the octreotide, will have an affinity for those receptors, and so it will bind those, and so we'll also see a, a marker lighting up somewhere else. So that's the octreo scan, and then here's some just fun facts for the MEN evalu evaluation. I feel like I already talked about a lot of that. Um, okay, next slide, 12. Perforated gastric ulcers may erode the left gastric artery. So this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. So there, there's ulcer complications, okay, so four big ones, bleeding, perforation, obstruction, and malignancy. So let's start at the bottom because these are easier. So malignancy in general can also cause an obstruction. Um, if you're thinking malignancy, you might be thinking like malt lymphoma from H. pylori, for example. <clears throat> if you have an obstruction, typically this happens kind of in this region where, where you have any narrowing like in the pyloric uh, channel or certain regions, the duodenum. Um, in terms of uh, perforation, Typically, if you have a perforation, it's typically in the anterior duodenum wall. And I kind of remember this because if you perforate anteriorly, you enter the peritoneal cavity. And we call, when that air that's inside the duodenum gets into the peritoneal cavity, we call that pneumoperitoneum. In other words, air into the peritoneal cavity. And that produces a very distinct image that um, you see here. It's very subtle, but this is an extremely high-yield image for now and for the rest of your uh, career, if you see air under the diaphragm, that's indicating that this is a pneumoperitoneum and it could be due to a perforation from an ulcer or a general a perforation from anything. Um, and that's uh, somewhat of an emergency. It is an emergency. So um, also, if you have a uh, perforation in the anterior wall duodenum, you might also have referred pain to the shoulder just due to the proximity of the phrenic nerve. So that's perforation. Now, when we have bleeding, which is usually due to a rupture of a vessel at, a, at an ulcer, that typically is going to be in the posterior wall of the duodenum, okay? And the artery that's affected is the gastroduodenal artery. In other words, the artery that goes from the, the gastrum, the stomach, down to the duodenum. Now, this uh, image is, is very high yield in general, I would say, because understanding the anatomy is an important uh, part of doing well on, on any USMLE exam. Um, but one thing that I want to say is, um, there is an anatomy video that we made on this that you can go through and, and review some of this. So I'm going to go pretty quick through it just with respect to time. If you have a posterior ulcer here in the, in the duodenum, proximal duodenum, you can see that it would be directly affected by this gastroduodenal artery that's running behind the duodenum, right? So they're in close proximity. The lesser curvature of the stomach you can all you would it's the most common site for gastric ulcers. Remember we said that earlier. The lesser curvature of the stomach is the most common site for gastric ulcers. The left gastric artery, which comes directly off the celiac trunk, it's one of your three major branches of the celiac trunk, along with your uh, common hepatic and your splenic artery. When that comes off the celiac trunk, it goes right over the lesser curvature of the stomach, right here, and that's typically where you'll have a lot of these ulcers. And if they bleed there, then the bleeding and the rupture potentially is going to be affected by the left gastric artery. Okay, so that's particularly high yield to know. A neutrophilic infiltration is seen on gastric biopsies of acute gastritis. 
So what is gastritis? Inflammation of the gastric mucosa. There's two types, acute and chronic. So acute gastritis, typically you'll see a neutrophilic infiltration. Neutrophilic infiltrations are classic for acute processes, right? The neutrophils get to the site first. In chronic gastritis, you see more of the mononuclear infiltration, which can be macrophages. It can be plasma cells, lymphocytes. Remember when I said that if you do a biopsy of gastric mucosa and you see lymphocytes, usually you think malt lymphoma. If there's a lot of lymphocytes infiltrating, then it'll be, you know, more or less, you might be thinking malt lymphoma. If there's just a few here and there, that's more classic for chronic gastritis. Um, now, the acute gastritis is typically erosive, so it's usually direct mucosal damage, whereas the chronic um, is typically known as being more non-erosive. In the chronic, you have more atrophy of the tissue, so you have parietal cell atrophy, so the parietal cells aren't releasing as much acid, and we call that achlorhydria. Okay, now some, there's two types of chronic, they kind of distinguish them. There's a type A and a type B. The type A is typically in the fundus in the body, the stomach, so more proximal regions, and then the type B is more in the antrum, the pylorus. Overall, excuse me, the most common cause is H. pylori overall for gastritis but in the fundus in the body in the type a chronic gastritis a very specific subsection remember there's a lot of parietal cells here and so pernicious anemia is the most common type of type a's but overall i want you to know that h pylori is the most common cause of gastritis okay um also uh what did i not cover i think i covered all this and lastly acute gastritis it can be caused by NSAID use but don't be confused you can also get chronic gastritis from NSAID use right if you have someone that's been on NSAIDs forever it can exert a similar effect, right? Curling and Cushing ulcers, I promise I'll talk about those in a few slides. 14. Achlorhydria causes impairment of iron absorption in the duodenum. So really quickly, before I, I jump into that, let's just run down this list. So H. pylori, again, most common cause of gastritis. Uh, you can have a medication-induced gastritis, gastritis, right? NSAIDs uh, release uh, cox, or inhibit COX-1, which can inhibit prostaglandins, and that can kind of block that inhibitory pathway decreased mucosal blood flow, all that good stuff. Um, autoimmune gastritis is basically kind of like your pernicious anemia. So you have antiparietal and uh, anti-intrinsic factor antibodies that can lead to diffuse atrophy of parietal and chief cells. Now, particularly high yield to know, this is the important part. So iron deficiency anemia usually occurs before a B12 deficiency in many forms of gastritis, particularly the chronic gastritis. So let's take a look here. So this whole pathway we went through in the I think it was the anatomy physiology, the anatomy videos. I'm not sure, but we went through this whole pathway in one of the previous videos. Um, and so I'll go through it kind of quickly here. So when you take in food, you know, that has iron, a lot of times it's in the Fe3 plus state. We cannot absorb the Fe3 plus iron uh, well at all. And so that Fe3 plus iron gets reduced by duodenal cytochrome B to Fe2 plus. Now this process only works at low pH. If the pH is physiologic, like 7.4, it doesn't work good. Then most of the iron will be in Fe3 plus. But if it's a low pH, like we get in the proximal duodenum, right? Cause you still have the stomach acid still coming in. You're still neutralizing it, right? The pH is kind of low. Um, then this process happens very well. And so then the Fe2 plus will get taken up by the divalent metal transporter. That's how you remember that it's Fe2 plus that comes in, right? Divalent means two, Fe2 plus divalent metal transporter one, DMT one. And that brings it in the cell and then you can absorb it or do whatever you want with it. And we talked a lot about the rest of this um, in the previous videos on GI physiology and anatomy. Um, but my point here is when you have atrophy of the, of the mucosa and you have achlorhydria, that process isn't going to work good, right? Most of the Fe is going to be in the Fe3 plus state because the pH is now elevated. So typically you can't uptake the iron. So typically you'll get an iron deficiency anemia before B12 deficiency, even if you have antibodies to intrinsic factor. And that's because you usually, unless you're a vegan, you're going to have a lot of B12 stores, right? So even though you can't absorb it in the terminal ileum, you'll have stores built up. Also, last thing, um, if someone has autoimmune gastritis, check TSH for... Uh, Hashimoto's. 15. Cushing's ulcer is due to direct stimulation of acetylcholine at parietal M3 receptors. So again, going back to our classic image here. So what we're saying here is in Cushing's disease, let's talk about how intracranial pressure affects ulcers. So if you have an increase in intracranial pressure, let's say you have a, a brain tumor, traumatic brain injury, you have meningitis, encephalitis, whatever it is, some kind of pathology that's increasing intracranial pressure, that can lead to overstimulation of the vagus nerve. Okay. Remember, the vagus nerve directly innervates the M3 receptor on parietal cells. So if it's overstimulating the M3 receptor, you get more protons pumped into the lumen, and that can cause um, a very acidic environment and lead to an ulcer, right? So that's the concept with Cushing's ulcer. Okay. Now, Curling's ulcer is a little bit different. Curling's ulcer is due to a severe burn. When you have a severe burn, you lose a lot of intravascular volume, right? And in that process, you can become hypovolemic. You can get um, you know, shock liver, you can get AKI, right, um, due to pregrenal kind of um, pathology, and you can also get um, effects in the GI mucosa, including ischemia, cell necrosis, and slowing of gastric mucosa. 
There's other causes of gastritis that I didn't list here. There's if you have uremia, uremic toxins can cause gastritis. Vasopressors, right? If you have vasopressor, you can have vasoconstrict, decreased perfusion. That can lead to ischemia. So kind of keep them all in mind. The way I remember this is when I hear a curling ulcer, I think of a curling iron. And I think that if you put your hand on a curling iron, it's going to burn your hand. So I just remember uh, severe burns with uh, curling ulcers. Okay, 16. Foveolar hyperplasia of gastric mucosa is classic for Montreal's disease. I don't know how to pronounce this this disease uh, name, but um, I took a couple years of French, so I'm going to say Montreal. Um, so there's two things I want you to remember about this pathology. The first one is that it's due to excessive mucus production. Um, and the second thing is there's excessive secretion of TGF alpha. So I just want you to remember those two things. The first uh, mucus production, I'll come back to in a second, but the TGF alpha. So what does TGF alpha have to do with anything? TGF alpha is a ligand for epidermal growth factor receptor, and it activates signaling pathways for cell differentiation, proliferation. It does this in keratinocytes uh, commonly, but it also does it in the uh, GI mucosa. Particularly, the big thing you want to know is that TGF-alpha inhibits gastric acid secretion. Um, in this disease process, there's too much of it, and so it inhibits a lot more gastric acid secretion than it should, leading to achlorhydria. This TGF-alpha is a potential prognostic marker for gastric carcinoma. That's particularly high yield to know. Hyper, this disease process leads to a hypertrophic gastropathy. So you have these massive, massive gastric folds. They're said to have like a brain-like appearance or cerebriform appearance. Um, and um, it's classic for this Montreal's disease. Now, if you did histology, which USMLE step one, even some of Comlex one, they love histology. So um, you see a foveolar hyperplasia. So what is a foveolar, fove, I can't even say, foveolar hyperplasia, which is a hyperplasia of the surface and glandular mucus cells. So there's a ton of mucus cells. That's where this excessive mucus production comes from. So you can see it here. You see all of these white cells, all of these mucus cells everywhere in the GI mucosa, which is not a common finding. Okay. Now, according to ICD-10 cl classifications, they say that this is a type of gastritis. But in reality, um, the way this is actually kind of said to exist is that this is actually considered to be one of two hypertrophic gastropathies. It's not a form of gastritis because there's really no inflammatory infiltrate here, okay? That was a finding we found with chronic gastritis. There's really not a lot of that here. It's just this excessive production of mucus cells, and so this is said to be a form of hypertrophic gastropathy. Um, the one other hypertrophic gastropathy you should be aware of is something we already talked about. That is Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. In any case, foveolar hyperplasia is particularly high yield to know, and that's referring to these mucus cells. Again, minimal inflammatory infiltrate. That's why it's technically not a gastritis, and you have atrophy of parietal cells because of the TGF alpha. This leads to a difficulty absorbing protein, and so you have a protein losing gastropathy. So these patients will commonly have low albumin and edema, along with a lot of what you would expect to see in a um, in a gastritis. And you would have to obviously do an upper endoscopy and biopsy to, to officially diagnose this, or you could do an X-ray, and sometimes you can see a little bit of these folds on X-ray, but officially you'd want to do an upper endoscopy. Seventeen. So tuximab is a first-line treatment for Montreal's disease. Um, so a couple more things about Montreal's disease. First, it's pre-malignant, so it can lead to gastric adenocarcinoma, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It has some associations with CMV and H. pylori. So H. pylori can do all kinds of damage. It can cause malt lymphoma. It, can, it also has an association with causing this Montreal's disease, which is a pre-malignant condition. Again, endoscopy is your go-to gold standard. And cetuximab, so what is cetuximab? It's a monoclonal antibody versus the epidermal growth factor receptor. Remember, this is a receptor that TGF-alpha binds to. So if you have too much TGF-alpha, you just attack the receptor with monoclonal antibody, and that will um, hopefully uh, resolve some of the symptoms. And this is commonly the first-line therapy, okay? So cetuximab is first-line therapy in um, Montreal's disease. And then you want to have a high-protein diet, right? That will uh, kind of assist with the um, hypoalbuminemia. You can do x-ray, like I said, to kind of detect the folds of the stomach. You can um, do CMV, H. pylori testing. That is important to kind of include in the evaluation just because there's associations with both of them. Um, and the other thing I want to say is um, the serum gastrin levels are typically normal in this uh, in this disease process. Okay, all right, eighteen. Diffuse type of adenocarcinoma is display signet ring cells on histology. Okay, so there's two kinds of adenocarcinomas. Um, and by the way, gastric adenocarcinomas is the most common type of. Uh, cancer in the stomach. 90% of stomach cancers approximately are uh, adenocarcinomas. And adenocarcinoma, remember, adeno is gland, so they originate in the glandular epithelium of the gastric mucosa. So there's two types. There's intestinal and diffuse. Intestinal is the most common type, okay? So why is it called intestinal? It's called intestinal because on histology, it resembles intestinal adenocarcinoma, right? Intestinal means like small intestine, large intestine. So in the stomach, 
you shouldn't have villus-like projections, right? It's not something, you don't have a lot of absorption in the stomach, right? You do in the, uh, the small and large intestines. So um, what you can see here is some prominent intestinal metaplasia in this in this uh, gastric tissue sample. You, and it's hard to see here, but there's some there's some goblet cells. So you have a presence of a decent amount of goblet cells, but more importantly, you have little to no parietal cells, and you have this epithelium that's forming these finger-like projections that you normally would not expect to see in gastric mucosa. Remember, in gastric mucosa, you'd have like gastric pits and that kind of thing, but um, this is a very unique uh, image here that you really wouldn't commonly see in um, the gastric mucosa. So intestinal metaplasia eventually can lead to dysplasia and endocarcinoma. And remember, this is all happening because there's something, there's some stimulus that's causing damage or inflammation to the gastric mucosa and um, eventually leading to atrophy of the parietal cells, achlorhydria. Because there's no acid now being released into the lumen, you get this hypergastronemia that's trying to stimulate these parietal cells, even though there's really not a lot of them there because of the atrophy. Okay. Um, now the diffuse type of anocarcinoma is um, sometimes referred to as this, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, but this linitis plastica. So the reason that it's called linitis plastica is due to a very stiffened wall of the gastric mucosa, and it's got like a thickened leather-like appearance typically. Okay, and I didn't include an image here, but you can you can look one up on Google. Um, sometimes it's also called mucinous or, or, or colloid um, anocarcinoma. So the idea here is it, with this pathology, it's typically um, there's a defect in the intercellular adhesion. So in the biochemistry videos, I talked about e heron having a big effect on this. And in particular, there's mutations in this e herons that connect these cells, and that leads to this pathology. And so what you end up seeing typically in this pathology is these tumor cells that are discohesive, okay? So they're kind of doing whatever they want and they're secreting large amounts of mucus. And if that mucus is held intracellularly, it builds up in the cell and it pushes the nuclei all the way off to the side of the cell. And that's called a signet ring cell because the nuclei is almost looks like a little top of a ring surrounding the cell structure. Um, and I'll show you a couple images of that. And typically the diffuse type, I don't want to say typically, but the diffuse type is more well known to be hereditary. So sometimes people might have this in autosomal dominant condition Condition where they've had the diffuse type for a long period of time in their family and they'll these people you know when you're 30 years old you'll have like a subtotal colectomy they'll take the whole stomach out prophylactically um, similar to like in BRCA you know positive patients where they take they do like a um, bilateral salpingo or something like that but in any case here we go so here's the image um, you can see that these these nuclei are pushed way off to the outskirts of the of the cell a lot of them here and these are signet ring cells okay so these are classic for this diffuse type of adeno uh, carcinoma 19. Type A blood increases risk of intestinal gastric endocarcinoma. I found this really interesting, um, and this is mentioned in first aid as well, as well as in a lot of research articles, so it seems like it's a relatively high yield fact to remember. Um, some risk factors that kind of make a little bit more sense, H. pylori, right, that can cause inflammation, that can lead to um, endocarcinoma, tobacco use, pernicious anemia, um, <clears throat> some other big ones are diet, right? Nitrates, cured meats, smoked foods are classically associated with gastric endocarcinomas, low vitamin A and C. Um, if you have GERD, right, that can lead to endocarcinoma of the esophagus through Barrett's esophagus. It can also cause um, symptoms in the stomach, obesity is associated with that. Um, and then I listed some more here just for your uh, for your viewing pleasure just to, to review, but I think those are the ones that I mentioned are the big ones. 20. Left supraclavicular endopathy can be a sign of metastatic disease. So um, the left uh, supraclavicular endopathy is known as Virchow's uh, node, and you can see it here. Here's some. Here's the uh, clavicle bone, and you have some supraclavicular adenopathy on the left side of this patient. And um, this is classically associated with metastatic uh, lymphatic spread. Um, these patients, you, you know, any patient that has one of these findings or um, or doesn't, you always want to look out for the alarm symptoms, which I listed here again. We talked about these at great length, so I just put them here again for your review. Um, some other important nodes to be aware of. So you have your sister Mary Joseph node. That is your uh, peri-umbilical node. Okay, so you can see that here. And that also indicates metastatic lymphatic spread. In a lot of cases, it suggests it. Um, and then the Irish node, which is not as high yield as these two, but um, that's a left axillary node that um, is commonly involved with metastatic lymphatic spread. So all on the left side there. 21. The Krukenberg tumor is classically bilateral uh, ovary masses secondary to direct metastasis of gastric adenocarcinoma. So I know this isn't uh, correct English here, so uh, I, I, I probably butchered the sentence a little bit, but what I'm trying to say is the Krukenberg tumor is a tumor of the bilateral ovaries. Typically, 80% of the time, it's bilateral ovaries, so not always, but typically, in a board question, it will probably be bilateral. And um, this is due to um, metastasis 
commonly from the um, gastric tissue. And usually you'll get this signet ring pathology signifying that it's probably from the diffuse type of adenocarcinoma. Okay, so that's the Kruckenberg tumor. And here's two ovaries. You can see that they're very enlarged relative to the uterus there. Okay. Now the bloomer shelf, this is due to um, direct metastasis to the cul-de-sac, potentially from a gastric uh, carcinoma. So um, recall that the cul-de-sac, we're talking about the pouch of Douglas, which in females is this rectouterine pouch. So you can see the bladder here, you can see the uterus, and then there's this pouch between the uterus and the rectum. So uh, commonly tumors uh, can metastasize here in this region, and if you're doing a um, vaginal exam, you can actually palpate the tumor if you're doing a rectal exam. In males, more commonly an erectile exam, right? In males, it's the rectal vesicle pouch, right? Because they don't have the uterus here. They just have the bladder, um, and then they have the pouch, and then you have the, the rectum here. So that's the kind of that same region that it can um, metastasize to, and that region is known as the uh, pouch of Douglas, okay? And then you can also get ascites if the tumor metastasizes to the um, more anterior region of the peritoneal cavity. You can get peritoneal carcinomatosis. 22. The sign of lesser chalot can be diagnostic of underlying gastric malignancy. So here, um, so in general, these are called seborrheic keratoses. They have a waxy uh, kind of stuck on appearance is the classic way that they're described. And um, they're, you know, normally if you have one or two of these, it's it's not, you know, something to worry about unless it's growing rapidly or something like that. Now, if you have a bunch of these that come out of nowhere and they're growing and, you know, um, they're increasing in size, like I said, in number, this is associated typically with cancers, and that's called the sign of lesser chalot, okay? So it's a diffuse, rapid growth and number and size of seborrheic keratoses, okay? The other thing I put on here is um, Trousseau syndrome, Trousseau syndrome, sorry, and that's the migratory thrombophilitis. So, so this always kind of confused me because I didn't quite understand exactly what this was. So uh, essentially, this is episodes of vessel inflammation due to blood clots, okay? And, and um, you know, normally when you think about a blood clot or a venous thromboembolism, right, you're thinking of the deep veins. So in this syndrome, it's the, actually the superficial veins that are getting clotted. And so it's very unusual. And so there, there's recurrent clots and usually in different spots. That's why it's called migratory thrombophlebitis, okay? And it's usually, like I said, superficial veins and uncommon sites. So you might have it in the leg, you might have it in the arm, in the chest wall, you might have these. And so they're very unusual and these are associated with um, gastric cancer, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer. Um, and sometimes you'll see them in a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, right? Because the clots can um, have a, have uh, cut the blood vessels essentially. And so you'll get like a microangiopathic uh, hemolytic anemia because of that. Um, and um, you might get like schistocytes and that, and that kind of thing. Um, and you can also see membranous nephropathy, which is essentially glomerular basement membrane thickening due to immune complex uh, deposition and a lot of things can cause the membranous nephropathy. I mean, this can be drugs, infections, autoimmune conditions, cancer. 23. Anocarcinoma is classically seen in the distal esophagus. So I know this isn't gastric stuff, but I forgot to put this in the esophageal pathology video, so I'm going to go over it really quickly here. Esophageal carcinoma, there's two types, two big types, anocarcinoma, squamous cell. Squamous cell is the most common cause worldwide. Anocarcinoma is the most common cause in the U.S. Anocarcinoma is the lower one-third of the esophagus. This should make sense to you if you remember like GERD and Barrett's esophagus, right? You have reflux coming up that is associated with causing adenocarcinoma. So that's why it's the lower one third because gastroesophageal reflux is really affecting that region. The upper two thirds, particularly the middle of the esophagus, really any strong irritant to that mucosal tissue can cause squamous cell carcinoma. But typically GERD is associated with adenocarcinoma. Typically GERD won't get that high. So for squamous cell carcinoma, we're talking about hot liquids, um, acidic like strictures, achalasia can be involved in it if you have structures that are kind of building up back up to the middle of the esophagus and damaging the mucosa, alcohol, any kind of radiation therapy, so any kind of irritant, really. plumber vincent syndrome is associated with squamous cell carcinoma more so because recall plumber vincent syndrome is due to webs more at the post-cricoid region, so more proximal, right? So remember that from the esophageal videos. So it's not distal, it's more proximal, and so that's why it's more commonly associated um, with squamous cell carcinoma. Smoking can affect either one, okay? So I just wanted to uh, clear that up because sometimes that can get confusing. In general, esophageal cancers have really poor prognoses. That's because there's a lack of serosa around the esophageal wall and you can get rapid extension of the cancer. And um, always upper endoscopy um, when there's any alarm symptoms. Last thing, actually, um, when you have esophageal carcinoma, you'll have dysphagia to solids, then liquids usually, versus achalasia, which you'll have um, restriction of both pretty rapidly. 24. Keratin pearls are classically seen in squamous cell carcinoma. So for your viewing pleasure, if we're comparing histology between uh, squamous cell carcinoma and anocarcinoma, so here's squamous cell carcinoma, this thing in the middle, I don't know if this is a good 
image or not. Here we go. So that's a keratin pearl. When you see keratin pearls, draw your attention immediately to squamous cell carcinoma, particularly in the esophagus here uh, and what we're talking about. Um, Anocarcinoma, typically, again, this is a glandular carcinoma, so you'll see invading clusters of, of glands and that kind of thing, cohesive clusters of cells, um, and there's all this glandular tissue here, and a lot of these cells have cytologic features of malignancy, um, like uh, variable nuclear size and, and um, shape um, and that kind of thing. So, But the big thing here are the keratin pearls that really um, makes the squamous cell carcinoma stand out a little bit more. And also, oh, last thing I want to show you here. <clears throat> so you can see on this side, you have some stratified squamous tissue. And then here you have this abrupt uh, discontinuation of that squamous tissue to um, form this more um, glandular tissue. And so that's kind of classic too for your Barrett's esophagus that eventually leads to uh, adenocarcinoma. This would be normal esophagus into some uh, dysplastic process. Okay, guys, thank you for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you think that the um, camera stuff in the corner is too distracting or something like that, just let me know. Let me know what you think. Um, I'm kind of just messing around with things to see what people like and if things um, you know help or don't help. You know, like I said, I'm just experimenting. So thank you for watching. Please like the video if you if you liked it, and um, if you're not already subscribed, um, please consider doing so for more videos. Thanks for watching.